Imagine for a minute that you are a recreational golfer and you're out going to go play around and you notice following you around is Tiger Woods. Imagine for a moment that you, you portray yourself as some sort of a football broadcaster. And you go to a Viking game and you're kind of pretending you're doing the play-by-play -play and you look next to me and there's Paul Allen. Imagine what it's like to preach with Wes Feltner sitting in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been dealing with today. Um, so I don't, I'm as disappointed as you are that I'm up here. And I can see it in your faces, but that's okay, I don't take it personally. Uh, if you get a chance to meet Neil here at uh, Faith Family, he's, he's usually around. Uh, get to know him. Uh, he is uh, one of the, the handful of people, along with young Christy over here, who had the foresight to start this church. And uh, in fact, there he is back there in the corner. Introduce yourself to him if you haven't met him. He's become one of my closest friends on the earth. And we are partners in a project here at Faith Family called Outreach. And we really don't know exactly what that means, but what, what it means for this message is how do we take this church out into the community? How do we affect the communities in which we're in positively for Jesus Christ? And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be up here on the screen. Beginning with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the internal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And they will also answer, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And you will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. Father God, we are, uh, we are so thankful for what you're doing here at Faith Family. It has been uh, amazing to watch over the past year and a half. Thank you for people like Neil and Christy and others who had the wisdom to start this church, and we're so thankful for what you've done. We, we've been amazed by the growth, not only in numbers, but in the, the lives of the people that have been here. We are so thankful for Pastor Wes. But we want to please you. We want to be a church that makes you happy, that you're, you're proud of. Help us through this message today. Learn a little bit more about what it is you want us to do and how we should do it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a group called Feeding America that deals with hunger issues for children. And they estimate that 11.2% of the children in Dakota County go to bed at least one night a week hungry. 11.2% of the children in Dakota County. And I think 
that most of the churches in Dakota County don't give a damn. In fact, I'm willing to bet that they'd be more upset with I just said give a damn from the pulpit than they are with 11% of the children being hungry. And that's what I want to talk about is our priorities. I've shared with you that I spent eight years in the Minnesota House of Representatives, 1993, 1995 to 2003. And all eight of those years, I served in the State Government Finance Committee. Four years in the minority and four years in the majority as vice chair. It's a fate I wouldn't wish on anybody. <laughs> From January until May, morning, noon, and night, you get a parade of agency heads that come before your committee telling you why they need more money for the next biennium than you gave them the last biennium. I first made the St. Paul Pioneer Press about two weeks into my legislative career. The Department of Administration came before our committee and they had a line item for $80,000 to clean the Leif Erickson statue outside the state office building. And I, I suggested to the commissioner that I could bring a Boy Scout troop up from Lake City. <laughs> and if we bought them buckets and brushes and some bleach and took them to McDonald's when they were done, we could get this job done for 200 bucks. That ain't the way government works. <laughs> Several weeks later, the governor's office came before the committee. And if you remember your state history, 1995, Arne Carlson was governor. And the legislators were scared to death of Arne Carlson. He still holds the record for the most vetoes by any governor. And so if you had a project that you wanted funded in your district, you really went out of your way not to irritate Arne. Well, his chief of staff came before the committee with the office budget for the governor. And in there was a line item for $35,000 for additional entertainment expenses. And I shared with the chief that I had been doing homework with my daughter, who was at the time a freshman at Lake City High School. And I noticed that in her history book, the last president listed there was Jimmy Carter. And so I suggested to the chief that maybe that money would be better served buying new history books for Lake City High School. Well, that got me in the newspaper again. <laughs> it got me the undying admiration of the Democrats who were running the committee, and it got me summoned to the governor's office later that afternoon, where I got chewed on for 45 minutes for embarrassing the chief of staff in front of the committee. That budget that we worked on in 1995 was $18 billion. The budget Governor Walz just proposed last month for this biennium is $52 billion. It took 140 years for the state of Minnesota to get to the point where it had an $18 billion budget. It took them 25 years to triple it. And of Governor Walz's proposed $52 billion budget, 37%, ironically, $18 billion, goes to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless, and take care of the sick. And that doesn't count federal programs like food stamps, Medicaid, Medicare, Federal Housing Administration. That's just state money for the hungry, the homeless, the naked, and the sick. And I believe the reason that the government is spending that much money on those programs is because the church has abdicated its responsibility to the poor. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells us very plainly what he expects from his church. And the disciples showed us in their work back in the, in the book of Acts that they understood exactly what Jesus said. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 44, the, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to any among them that had need. Acts 4, verse 34, there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who earned lands, owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, the Cretan Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word to wait on tables. Brothers, select seven men from among you and we will turn this responsibility over to them. Now we just decide to pay a little bit more in taxes and let Caesar do it. And it just doesn't work, especially when you're sitting in government as I did. These people don't understand why people are hungry or why they're homeless, or why they're sick. Half of that budget that's been proposed pays for the people to pass out the checks. They're, they're not ministering, they're not learning, they're not, and it's not their fault, I'm not blaming them, it's just their job. <laughs> Meg and I, uh, as many of you, came here from another church. About five years ago, the church we were at, the elder board came before us with a plan. They had to grow the church. They had to make it bigger. We were running out of room. We want to build another church in another suburb. And we're going to build a cafe. We're going to have a cafe where you can get a latte or a coffee and take it into church with you. It's a multi-million dollar plan, including millions and millions of dollars in debt. The night we were scheduled to vote, Meg and I were sitting at a stoplight waiting to turn into the church. And there was a young lady standing on the boulevard with one of those sling things around her neck that holds an infant. She was holding a sign that said, please help. When we got in there for the vote, Meg and I were two of a handful of people had voted no. I had passed with about 98 point some percent of the vote. And over the next couple of years, the project was done. And almost every week, when we'd sit at that boulevard, at that stoplight, waiting to turn into church, there'd be somebody standing there holding a sign saying, please help. And I wondered, what would happen if one of the disciples came back and was walking into church? Would he have come in and sat down in the cafe and had a frappuccino? Or would he have been out on the boulevard ministering to that woman? I told Wes, I teased Wes, I was going to tell my favorite Wes Feltner story tonight. And it was last Halloween. I was sitting right over there, and Wes came up to do an announcement. And he came up, remember, it was the, the Saturday night was Halloween evening, eve the 30th, and uh, Halloween was the next day, Sunday. And Wes came up with his normal enthusiasm to do announcements, and he said, this is one of my favorite holidays. I don't know if any of you remember that. I'll never forget it. And I thought to myself, that's odd. Not that I have anything against Halloween. I was just anxious to hear why it was one of Wes's favorite holidays. And he said, yeah, tomorrow's Reformation Day. And he, he talked about how the next day, the 31st of October, is Reformation Day, the anniversary of when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of All Saints Church. And I, that's stuck with me over the years because I've been a student of the Reformation for the past 20 or 30 years. I'm just fascinated by it. I've told you that, you know, Elijah was one of my favorite people because of the incredible faith he showed. And, one of, you know, when you get the glory, obviously you want to see Jesus. But I want to sit down with Elijah. And I want to sit down with some of the Reformers because they're just 
fascinate me. And I, I've shared that I graduated, did my seminary work at Moody, but I did some post-grad study at a Reformed Theological Seminary down in Mississippi. And the reason I did that was because one of my heroes in the faith, Dr. R.C. Sproul, was the head of systematic theology at Reformed. And uh, for those of you that don't know Dr. Sproul, he just passed away a couple of years ago. But he was a, he's a brilliant theologian, great teacher, prolific author, wrote dozens of books, Two of them are, are recognized as classics. The first one's called Chosen by God. And if you have any concerns about your eternal security, read Chosen by God. And the second one is called The Holiness of God. And I want to just read a brief excerpt from that book because it's an amazing story. On a sultry day in July of 1905, a lonely traveler was trudging over a parched road on the outskirts of the Saxon village of Stotternheim. He was a young man, short but sturdy, and wore the dress of a university student. As he approached the village, the sky became overcast. Suddenly there was a shower and then a storm, and a bolt of lightning knocked the man to the ground. Struggling to rise, he cried in terror, Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. The man who thus called upon a saint was later to repudiate the cult of saints. He who vowed to become a monk was later to renounce monasticism. A loyal son of the Catholic Church, he was later to shatter the structure of medieval Catholicism. A devoted servant of the Pope, he was later to identify the Popes with the Antichrist. This young man was Martin Luther. The chapter of the book that this was in, in the holiness of God, was called The Insanity of Luther. The people of his time thought he was crazy. But Dr. Sproul's theory is that he wasn't crazy, he was a genius. He was probably the brightest legal mind of his day. And following that bolt of lightning, he poured himself into the study of scriptures. And it was from that study that he saw that his church had lost its way. And from that came the 95 Theses in 1517 that changed the church. You know, it wasn't like you could go to church down the street if you didn't like the church you were going to. You know, there wasn't a Baptist church across town or a Presbyterian church down the block. There was this church. And it was also from that study that Martin Luther became the original Calvinist. John Calvin didn't come along for another 25 years. And yet, most people give him the credit or blame for the Reformed theology regarding election and adoption. But the fact is that Luther wrote far more on that subject than Calvin ever did. And in fact, most of what Calvin wrote, including his classic, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, was commentary on Martin Luther's teaching. And it was from that study that Luther taught that regeneration precedes faith. We've heard Pastor West talk every week during his study on the Beatitudes about how we are spiritually penniless. In Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about how we were, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Dead people can't believe. Luther taught that dead people can't have faith. Dead people can't see Christ. You don't believe, Luther taught, and then are born again. You're born again, and then you believe. 
And Luther pondered what his reaction should be to that incredible gift. The teachers of his day said, well, you know, God did that just because it pleases him. But Luther wanted more than that. And back then, as you know, there wasn't any mass media. There wasn't any television or newspaper or radio. Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. The only way to communicate with the masses was by writing. And so Luther would write pamphlets and distribute them to as many people as would take them. And in 1520, three years after the 95 Theses, Luther wrote a pamphlet entitled The Freedom of the Christian. I just want to read you an excerpt of that. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant to all, subject to all. Individuals don't live for themselves alone, but they live also for all the people on the earth. To this end, they bring their bodies into subjection that they be more sincerely and freely serve others. As Paul says in Romans 14, if we live, we live to the Lord. Accordingly, the apostle commands us to work with our hands to support ourselves. However, that we may be also to give to those in need. Ephesians 4.28 this is truly the Christian life. Here, faith is truly active through love, Galatians 5, 6, that it finds expression in works of the freest service, cheerfully and lovingly done, with which man willingly serves another without the hope of reward. Although Christians are free of all works, they ought in this liberty to empty themselves, take upon themselves the form of a servant and serve, help, and in every way deal with their neighbors as they see God through Christ has dealt and still deals with them today. They ought to think, although I am unworthy and condemned, my God has given me in Christ all the riches of righteousness and salvation without any merit on my part out of pure free mercy. Why should I not, therefore, freely, joyfully, with all my heart, and with an eager will, do all things which I know are pleasing and acceptable to such a Father who has overwhelmed me with his estimable riches? I will therefore give myself as a Christ to my neighbor, just as Christ offered himself to me. That was Luther's response to the gift that he had been given by Christ. Now let's look back at Matthew chapter 25. If you remember, really the first verse is critical. Because in that verse, we find out that Jesus, this parable that Jesus was telling, was not about the biblical times. And it's not about today. It's about a time in the future. Then the kingdom of heaven, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, he will then sit on his glorious throne. This is when he comes back. This is after the rapture. It's after the tribulation. Israel has been hanging on by a thread all alone, and Jesus, and hopefully us, come back with him. And now it's the time for the final judgment for those people who were alive on the earth at the time when Jesus comes back. And he separates them into groups, the sheep and the goat. And he tells the sheep because they took care of the poor. 
Remember he said, you did it for the least of these, my brothers. Now my brothers he's talking about there are the Jews. And so the sheep are the people who helped the Jews, who fed them, who clothed them, who visited them, who ministered to them. The goats were the ones that didn't. Now isn't it interesting that when Jesus separates them right at the beginning of this section, he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. You notice how he tells them apart. It wasn't the ones that had the big buildings. It wasn't the one who had the cafe. He knew them by how they administered to the poor. That's a challenge for us, my friends. I want to tell you a story from one of my, another one of my favorite people. A guy named Tony Campolo. I don't know if any of you have heard of Tony. Tony's 86 now. He pastors a Baptist church in Pennsylvania. And Tony used to travel around the country and the world speaking on this subject in churches and in pastor's conference. And one year he was asked to speak in a pastor's conference in Honolulu. And so Tony flies from Philadelphia to Honolulu. And the first night there he wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning because it's 9 o'clock in the morning in Philly. And he's wide awake. And so he gets dressed and he decides he's going to go find some place where he can get some breakfast. And he staggers out and he walks around and all he can find is this greasy spoon down a side street. And when he tells the story, he said, I wouldn't even touch the menu. So he ordered a donut and a cup of coffee. And he's sitting in there eating his donut when nine very loud and boisterous ladies of the evening come into the cafe. And, of course, he can hear everything they're saying. And one of them mentions that tomorrow is her birthday. And her colleagues give her a little grief. Oh, what do you want us to do, throw you a party? And she said, well, no, no one's ever given me a birthday party, but I'm going to be 39 tomorrow, and I just thought you might want to know. So Tony gets this idea. And he goes to the old boy behind the counter, who he learns his name is Harry. And Harry's the owner of this fine establishment. Harry and his wife. And Tony says, they come in here every night. And Harry says, like clockwork. By then, Harry's wife comes out and is joining in the conversation. And Tony says, I got an idea. That one over in the corner there mentioned that tomorrow is her birthday. And Harry's wife said, that's Agnes. She's a sweetheart. She's always trying to help people. And and Tony says, how about if we throw her a party? How about I go out and get a bunch of decorations, and we bake her a cake, and we have a surprise party? And Harry says, that's a great idea. You go buy the decorations, I'll bake the cake. So the next night, sure enough, in comes Tony, he's hanging balloons and streamers. And like clockwork, in come the girls. And Harry and Tony and his wife, or Tony and Harry and his wife, come out from behind the counter with a birthday cake with candles. Sing happy birthday. And obviously Agnes is just a mess. And Harry puts the cake in front of her and uh, said, I blow out the candles, here's a knife, cut the cake. And Agnes says, Harry, no one's ever given me a birthday cake. Would you mind if I took this home? 
I live just down the street. I won't be gone long. But I'd just like to take this home. And so Harry said, well, it's your cake. Go ahead. So Agnes carries this cake out the door like it's the Holy Grail. And of course, there's a kind of an awkward silence in the cafe while Agnes is gone. And Tony says, well, hey, uh, how about we pray for Agnes? A little, little prayer for Agnes. And so he leads them in a prayer for Agnes, for her health, for her salvation, that God would be good to her. And Harry looks at Tony and goes, I didn't know you were a preacher. And Tony tells him the story about how he pastors a church back in Pennsylvania, and he was here speaking at a pastor's conference. <laughs> Harry kind of wrinkles up his face and goes, what kind of church do you pastor? Tony said, I pastor a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes. <laughs> the lead team here at uh, First Family, or Faith Family, not First Family, Faith Family, uh, we've been working on something called a vision statement. And it's really just about why do we exist? What do we want faith family to look like when it grows up? And Pastor West, and I didn't know he was going to be here tonight. <laughs> he told me he was going fishing. Yeah, I guess he did. But I asked him if I could quote him because he wrote something that uh, I, I think was profound as part of this vision statement. I just want to read you a couple lines of it. Our structure is simple. Faith family is committed to a simple approach to ministry. Rather than building a ministry around large buildings and programs, we focus on building people who make an impact in our community. Our approach is grace. We are all a broken people who Christ is still transforming. Because of that, faith family is a place where prodigals can come home. The broken can find healing, the marginalized can find mercy, and the lonely feel loved. We have experienced the grace of God, and we desire to express that same grace to others. Good stuff. Unquote. And maybe a church that would throw a birthday party for prostitutes. Let's pray. Father, we're trying. We are so thankful for the gifts you have given us. We stand in awe as Martin Luther did 500 years ago as we ponder what you've done for us. And we stand in awe with how little you ask of us in return. But we pray that you will help us to do those things. Again, we are so thankful for what you're doing in this congregation. We're thankful for Pastor Wes. We're thankful for the growth that we've seen. Not just in the numbers. We don't care about numbers. But we see the growth in people. And now, as Pastor Wes wrote, we want to take that out into the community and reach people for you. It's not easy. It takes money. It takes people. But we pray that you will give us the direction and the guidance to get that done. Because your church is the only hope we have. We can't rely on government, Father. You didn't want us to do it that way, and it just doesn't work. Give us the strength and the guidance. Continue to build us. Continue to give us strength. Continue to bless our pastor and the leadership team here at Faith Family. People like Neil. People who have vision. People who love you. 
We are thankful for all you've done for us and continue to stand in awe in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.